We at APHR are very pleased to have such a wide range of members of parliament and senators from Southeast Asia joining us today. And we're also happy that we have uh, to welcome non-APHR members who are here with us. For those of you who are not familiar with APHR, APHR is a regional organization of around 118 members from all over Southeast Asia. We also have associate members from other parliaments uh, in other parts of the world. We use our mandates to advocate for human rights inside and outside of the parliament, regionally, globally, and in our own respective countries. We work closely with civil society. We conduct fact-finding missions. We release um, uh, opinion statements, media releases. We do uh, toolkits for parliamentarians to help them in advocating for human rights and democracy. And also we try to capacitate our members in doing their mandates as activists and advocates for human rights and democracy. Now, let me just explain uh, the rationale behind this uh, webinar series. As we all know, measures to tackle COVID-19 pandemic have had a devastating impact on the region's economy. Business operations and supply chains have been disrupted. There's mass unemployment. Exchange rates have depreciated. The economies are reeling. And the pandemic also revealed major existing inequalities and weaknesses in our governance systems with the region failing prote to protect those in the most vulnerable positions. So I'm talking of day-to-day -day workers, women, indigenous peoples, those in the informal sector, the poor. The decisions made today on recovery plans will be shaping our collective future and determining the economic trajectory that the region takes. So we are gathered today to ensure that we, as members of the parliament from Southeast Asia, harness this historic opportunity to build back a stronger, greener, and more resilient economy by ensuring that economic recovery plans guarantee environmental sustainability human rights, and social justice. So our first webinar of this series will focus on the role that strengthening social protection systems can play in ensuring a more resilient economy, helping prevent poverty and unemployment and contribute to a swift economic recovery. This webinar, like the upcoming three uh, webinars in this series, is participatory in nature. So what do I mean by that? We would like to encourage interaction between and among the parliamentarians to learn from each other, as well as gain insights from the inputs coming from our experts and panelists. And hopefully through these informal discussions, we can also discuss possibilities of collaboration across countries, as well as uh, you know, asking APHR, what can we do to help you in carrying out your mandates. As our um, well, the first speaker, our special rapporteur from the United Nations, Dr. Olivier de Scooter, to present on the topic of strengthening social protection provisions in the economic recovery from COVID-19 in Southeast Asia. Sir? Thank you uh, very much, uh, Teddy Bangilat, for this introduction. And I, I really look forward to our exchanges and to listening to what uh, my esteemed colleagues, um, Risa Hondivoros and Kuhn um, Guyen, shall have to say. Um, let me perhaps start by uh, recalling that before the COVID-19 pandemic, significant progress had been made in the region towards strengthening social protection. This was the case in particular for old age pensions. Uh, a number of countries in the region had introduced non-contributory or partially contributory schemes leading to um, more or less universal coverage um, for old age uh, uh, people um, in a number of countries. And I don't have the figure for Southeast Asia per se, but in the Asian Pacific region, 55 percent of older persons um, um, were receiving a pension. 
um, not always at the level required, but they were receiving a pension. However, the benchmark in international human rights law is um, more requiring than this. And we have essentially two sources on the basis of which we assess the progress made by countries. The first is Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that refers to the right to social security and that has been interpreted by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in its general comment number 19 on the right to social security. And the second benchmark, the second ground for assessment is the well-known recommendation adopted by the International Labour Conference uh, unanimously in June 2012 on social protection flaws. And that's recommendation number 202 of the International Labour Organization. And that recommendation, which was um, highly um, publicized and, and again being adopted unanimously by governments, employers and workers, um, is very um, highly influential, um, stipulates that countries should adopt national social protection floors comprising at least four basic social security guarantees. A, essential healthcare, meeting the criteria of availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality. B, basic income security for children. Um, child allowances should allow access to nutrition, education, care, and so forth. Three, basic income security for all people in active age who cannot earn sufficient income by themselves. So this would cover cases of sickness, unemployment, maternity benefits, disability benefits. Fourth and finally, basic income security for older persons. And looking at those requirements, those expectations, those pledges, um, it is fair to say that in um, Southeast Asia and in the Asian Pacific region more generally, there still are some major gaps. For example, in Asia and the Pacific, 61% of the population receives no cash benefit at all. And the gaps are particularly important with respect to child and family benefits, in other terms, child allowances, except in some countries um, uh, such as um, Australia, Mongolia, who have achieved universal coverage in this regard. Secondly, although maternity benefits have been extended in recent years, only one third of mothers with newborns, 33%, receive cash maternity benefits. For unemployment benefits, the coverage remains extremely weak despite progress in Vietnam and some other countries. Only 22% of the region's unemployed persons receive unemployment benefits in large part due to the weight of informal uh, workers in the economy. Fourth and finally, only a very small minority of people with severe disabilities, some 9% receive disability benefits. And that is of course, a major gap in the systems. And so what happened following the pandemic is that a number of countries in the region have adopted measures to strengthen social protection. And my message to you today is this should be built upon and made permanent, developed into a rights-based social protection system that is consistent with the requirements of the ILO recommendation number 202. In fact, Countries in the region have moved in four directions. First, many actions were taken to protect better workers from the informal sector. Vietnam, for example, has introduced cash transfers for persons in principle not entitled to unemployment insurance, particularly informal workers, street vendors, waste collectors, and so on. The Philippines, under its um, uh, Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, the Bayanihan Act has introduced temporary short-term work programs to employ close to 1 million workers from the informal sector who had to interrupt their activities as a result of the very strict lockdown imposed in, in the Philippines. And under the temporary employment program, TUPAD, um, the beneficiaries receive 100% of the highest prevailing minimum wage per day, uh, which varies support according to the region. It's expected that 540,000 uh, people will benefit from this program. 
Um, outside Southeast Asia, we have, for example, also the, the case of the Indian state of Karnataka, where um, cash allowances were going to workers from the informal sector. So that's one direction in which countries have moved, protecting informal workers. Secondly, new cash transfer programs were introduced or conditions for access to cash transfers were loosened. Um, for example, in the Philippines, the conditions for receiving benefits under the national cash transfer program were temporarily sub suspended and an additional emergency subsidy was paid. And we had the same in, in the Indian state of Kerala. Thirdly, a number of countries have strengthened their public works programs, cash for work programs. Um, one um, famous of such programs is in India, of course, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act that provides 100 days of paid employment to rural households without any other source of income. But we have the same in other countries and the Philippine government, for example, has used public employment programs as a tool to reduce the negative impacts of the um, lockdown. Fourth and finally, uh, a number of countries have increased the levels of support provided. That was the case of, of China. Um, the National Assist Social Assistance Program, uh, DIBAO, was strengthened. In Indonesia, uh, the same happened. The benefit amounts of the food program were increased. In Thailand, um, the entitlement was increased to 70% of the full wage for 200 days in comparison to what was the case earlier, 50% for 180 days. And some 13 million workers have um, benefited from these strengthened unemployment benefits in the country. So these are interesting developments, but there are a number of challenges. And I'd like to cite in closing the nine challenges that I believe you as human rights parliamentarians face and that you should be attentive to in monitoring the action that governments are taking. First of all, in many cases, these measures I've described are short term and contingent in nature, often lasting during the duration of the lockdowns and relying on one time um, um, bills that have to be reapproved um, after a few months by uh, by the parliament uh, thank you for this reminder i'll i'll speed up um, yet what we what we need to have under recommendation 202 on social protection floors are standing rights based permanent social protection schemes that define people as rights holders um, who can um, benefit entitlements they may claim this is important to encourage parents to invest in the education of their children to reduce aversion to risk and to increase the take-up of social benefits by removing the shame stigma attached to um, uh, claiming benefits, by reducing the risk of discrimination and arbitrariness in the way the benefits are distributed. So that's the first challenge, to make this permanent, these uh, advances. Secondly, um, workers in the informal sector, although increasingly taken into account, are still insufficiently covered. Thirdly, in the region, there are many migrant workers who have no support or minimal support. One example is Australia, which is uh, very striking, with some um, 1.1 million temporary workers who, because of visa conditions, do not have access to social protection. 50,000 to 100,000 um, undocumented migrants in Australia are without any protection whatsoever, but that is not a problem limited to Australia. So that's a third issue, migrant workers. The fourth issue is how these social protection schemes are being financed. Equitable financing means re relying on progressive income tax schemes rather than increases of VAT rates or um, taxes on families. Um, we should not allow a situation in which social protection for poor families is paid by the poor themselves. Fifth, many of these programs have no accountability or oversight mechanism attached to them. As a result, um, when some groups of the population are not adequately covered, when some are discriminated, this is not brought to the attention of the authorities and there's no um, measure taken to overcome these gaps. And that is perhaps one important role parliamentarians can fulfill. Sixth, 
very often social services are strained and overwhelmed with applications that they must process in short periods of time and so they cannot follow the the speed at which they receive applications uh, for these um, uh, new measures that have been introduced it's a problem of capacity for these administrations seventh many of these benefits rely on online applications by the beneficiaries and in many cases um, the poorest amongst the poor have very weak broadband internet access they have difficulties filling in the forms and so many of them do not take up the benefits they normally have a right to because of their digital exclusion and that is another issue which i would like to draw your attention to eighth many of these social protection programs have not really included a gender dimension in order to use them to strengthen uh, the economic independence of women and to question gender roles i do not have time to detail this but if we have an opportunity to discuss this in some detail i'd like to explain how cash transfers public works programs asset transfers as in bangladesh for example um, and school feeding programs can actually serve to subvert gender roles and to strengthen the economic independence of women ninth and and finally and to close it's important to realize that in the region, despite the very strong rates of economic growth, um, the fiscal space remains constrained. And uh, Teddy, you mentioned the very uh, problematic capital flight from Southeast Asian countries leading to a devaluation of the local currencies. This, of course, mechanically increases the weight of the external debt, making it difficult for countries to finance social protection because they don't want to have an increase in the, in the uh, amount of debt uh, that may make it difficult for them to have access to finance on international markets. That is a major issue. And with my team, I'm working to strengthen the ability for the international community to provide support to countries in order to allow them to finance social protection by what we call a global fund for social protection. And that is, the ninth, the final challenge, which with respect to the international financing um, mechanism, we would like to see established in order to overcome this uh, fiscal gap that many countries still encounter. Many thanks indeed, and I very much look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Special Rapporteur. Um, indeed, governments are really struggling to come up with the budgets to support the social um protection programs we thank you for uh, discussing about the gaps uh, in asia pacific region of course uh, it's probably also symptomatic of uh, what we have here in the southeast asian region also citing examples of what countries have done uh, to address uh, social protection uh, issues uh, under the pandemic and more importantly discussing the nine challenges uh, I'm particularly struck by making these programs permanent and not just during the pandemic. So now, um, can we have uh, Ms. Risa Antiveras, the Honorable Senator from the Philippines, to present her experience and advice on promoting social protection and the right to health in her role as a senator during the COVID-19 economic recovery in the Philippines? Salamat, Teddy. Thank you. Uh, good day to my fellow parliamentarians. Uh, good day to uh, Mr. Olivier de Schutter, UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. Um, to the other colleagues, I can see here on my monitor, uh, Abel, uh, Representative Franz, uh, and other colleagues who are participating. I, I just can't see your faces and names right now. Uh, in spite of and uh, because of everything, it's a great honor to be here and to converse with all of you. It's been increasingly clear that we are facing a health and economic crisis of historic proportions. COVID-19 stopped us in our tracks and it has brazenly revealed long existing cracks in our systems and institutions. These cracks cost us our economy, these cracks cost jobs, these cracks cost us dignity, 
These cracks cost us lives. In March, during the first workday since Metro Manila here in the Philippines was put on lockdown, the image of hundreds of Filipino workers, commuters stranded on the streets, captured how we've failed our people. These Filipinos, in the absence of mass transport, were left to find their way. Some hitched rides on passing trucks, most walked for hours, while others slept on sidewalks. Also at the start of the lockdown, even our health workers, health frontliners, the frontliners in this battle against COVID-19 had little to no support. A physician from the Philippine General Hospital, the largest public hospital in the country, shared that some of their nurses were unable to work because of the lack of transport and the confusion in official pronouncements. On top of this, there were even cancer patients needing dialysis who were forced to walk for hours just to reach the hospital. For those here, dear colleagues, who are not yet aware of the Philippine General Hospital, it receives almost 600,000 patients every year, mostly consisting of indigent Filipinos from across the Philippines, some of whom even travel for days only to be seen for a few minutes. On March 24th, the Philippine Department of Health announced that it would turn the Philippine General Hospital into a COVID-19 referral hospital, requiring it to stop certain wards and intensive care units from operating so as to accommodate the impending wave of COVID-19 patients exclusively. It was heartbreaking to learn that even the chemotherapy and other treatment schedules of indigent children with cancer had to be canceled. So these are the people who fall through the cracks of our systems. These are the people who, without social protection, pre-COVID, fall into an even deeper pit in times of crisis. The increasing cases of COVID-19 in the country and our inability till now to flatten the curve, not only show the ineffective strategies of our government, but also that our health system was never kind to the vulnerable. That being the case, as a lifelong health advocate, I've always tried to ensure, together with leagues like former Representative Betty, to ensure that the laws we pass stem from addressing the needs of the most vulnerable uh, among us. And of course, Representative Francis also here in our webinar, the most vulnerable among us, the urban poor, the no work, no pay workers, the fisher folk, the homeless, the elderly, indigenous people, women across all these sectors, among others. In April, I filed a bill mandating life insurance and additional health insurance coverage for all workers in the public and private sectors compelled to render service outside the home during a public health emergency. As we seek to revive the economy, we must first ensure that our people are safe. What use is a, is a thriving economy when our own people are destitute? This act mandates employers to provide personal protective equipment for their employees, as well as cover health premiums should employees be diagnosed with the infectious disease. Our workers are the main drivers of our economy and a substantive economic recovery can't happen if they are not first and foremost safe and healthy. People first, that has been and will always be at the heart of this work. I'm sure this is true for all of you too. I've also been tasked this afternoon to share some of the laws we've passed that have indeed strengthened, increased, and broadened healthcare access and coverage for our people. As part of the House of Representatives in 2008, I co-authored the Cheaper Medicines Law because we found that the cost of medicines had been a burden to the majority of Filipinos. Nearly half or 41% of all healthcare spending in the Philippines has been going to pharmaceutical products. In comparison, other countries' share of medicines is as low as 19.7% in high-income countries and 30.4% in other low-income countries. I'm glad that through this measure, 
the Department of Health in February this year imposed a maximum drug retail price for more essential medicines after it was revealed that the price of drugs and medicines in the Philippines was still significantly higher and could go up to four times the international reference prices in the public sector and up to 22 times higher in the private sector. The passage of this law also became crucial to our implementation of the universal health care law, a landmark legislation which I also co-sponsored in 2019 as a senator. I'm truly proud of this law as it was a leap towards a more progressive and equal Philippines. This legislation reforms the health system into one in which every single Filipino can access health services regardless of our status or financial capability by making every Filipino a member of our national health insurance program. Even before the pandemic, it was a known statistic that he, here in the Philippines, six out of 10 patients die without ever seeing a doctor. Every year, one million Filipinos are also driven into poverty because of the health expenses they simply cannot afford. Through the universal health care law, we hope to change these statistics. At the height of the COVID-19 crisis in April, there were reports saying that patients were being refused by hospitals, not because of the hospital's overcapacity, but because they were not able to pay a deposit fee. That being the case, we had to execute a communications campaign on the strengthened anti-hospital deposit law, which we passed in 2017 to precisely prevent hospitals from withholding life-saving treatment to Filipinos. The Department of Health, which has premium responsibility over the implementation of this law, also echoed our call encouraging those who may have been refused admission in any hospital to come forward and report. Despite these laws being in place, unfortunately, our primary response has been often sidelined or has often sidelined the issues of the vulnerable. Women's needs, um, as Mr. Olivier mentioned, women's needs, for example, were never naturally embedded in the response to the pandemic. Due to COVID-19, it has been difficult for women to access family planning services, which experts say could result in more than 1.8 million unwanted and unplanned pregnancies this year. After this issue was raised, the Department of Health launched Family Planning on Wheels, a program in which health workers hand out three-month supply of reproductive health and family planning products to various communities. I'll catch that bell, Teddy. This would not have been possible if not for the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act of 2012, which Teddy and I also co-authored, then advocated. This law continues to enable and empower Filipinos, women in particular, to take control of our bodies and to guarantee access to family planning services for all citizens, including marginalized communities. And of course, in this pandemic, another invisible war that we are all battling is for our mental health. All of our lives changed in an instant. Meetings and conversations like this one, which we usually had in conference rooms, have suddenly turned into Zoom and other webinars. Overseas Filipino workers diligently working abroad suddenly had to be repatriated back to the Philippines with no assurance of job opportunities. Our children, who should be enjoying their ABCs in a classroom in the company of friends and classmates, are suddenly confined in virtual spaces not always conducive for fun or learning and not always closing the digital divide that Mr. Olivier mentioned. Despite this, what is heartening is that more Filipinos are talking about our mental health. We passed the Philippine Mental Health Law in 2018, and that was an ambitious and rigorous campaign to have more people talk about mental health. I'd like to believe that we have contributed to normalizing conversations surrounding mental health through this law. In fact, we've seen it in how when we launched our teletherapy hotline a few weeks after the COVID-19 lockdown was imposed, over 500 Filipinos availed of the service and over 30 psychologists volunteered.
In the passage of all these laws and the filing of bills, I have to admit, it never occurred to me then that they could be even more useful when a pandemic occurs. But they have been, and they will continue to be, precisely because the most vulnerable among Filipinos are always the first one we consider. The Filipino who can't afford overpriced medicines. The Filipino who was refused admission to a hospital. The Filipino who's under a nowhere, no pay contract or no contract. The Filipino who's jobless. The Filipino who walked for miles just to get home. Dear fellow parliamentarians and advocates, I know that you recognize these Filipinos in your own citizens too. Now more than ever, we've been called to step up for them, the people we are sworn to serve. Let's put their well-being first. Let's put their health and safety first. When we put them first, then economic recovery can be more sure to follow. Thank you very much for having me and a good day uh, to one and all. To those in the informal economy. And that would be the the topic of a short presentation to be done by Ms. Q, uh, Queen Nguyen. And then after that, uh, we will have uh, discussions coming from the participants. So Ms. Quinn, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. It's been very interesting listening so far. And I'm really excited uh, for the discussion, so I will keep myself uh, short. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to talk about uh, more a bit about the informal economy. And in fact, the among those who are really hardest hit by the lockdown measures are workers in the informal economy. Those are usually workers who are um, by law or in practice not covered by any formal arrangements. And they are traditionally very invisible in um, public policies. This includes workers, for example, um, own account workers, domestic workers, migrant workers, but also a lot of wage workers uh, who do not have access to social insurance, um, mostly working in, for example, micro and small enterprises. A lot of them are women, a lot of them are young or old. So there's like kind of some, of, some, some kind of intersectional vulnerabilities as well. And informal economy workers account for a really large proportion of the region's workforce. So at the ILO, we estimated that, that there are around 244 million workers in, um, in the ASEAN region. And this is really more than three in four workers are actually working in the informal economy. So if we're talking about extending social protection um, it is really a lot about extending to the informal economy, the workers who are very vulnerable to losing their incomes and to losing their, losing their livelihoods in a crisis like this one, but also in future crises. Climate change is a um, big challenge in the region as well. So, I mean, this is, we have to kind of realize as well that this won't be the only crisis facing us. And informal economy workers uh, usually um, lack the protection that formal jobs would usually provide. So they're neither covered by social insurance schemes where uh, you have to contribute to because usually they have rather limited financial capacities, but also they're often left out um, of the social assistance schemes, which are narrowly um, targeted to the poor. And as a consequence, as we've seen now in the crisis, millions of them cannot rely on a functional healthcare system in case they contract the virus, but also, or even if you have a, a health insurance system, um, they fall in poverty due to high expenses for health, as the challenge Senator Riza already mentioned before. Um, also, millions of people, men, children, women, elderly, who live from hand to mouth, they cannot afford staying at home. Of workers do not receive any compensation for the loss of income when they get sick or unemployed. And we have to ask ourselves, is this the, 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 the society we actually want to live in? And can we actually afford it as societies to leave three out of four workers unprotected in such cases? So thinking about um, 
all the responses which have been taken during the COVID crisis. As uh, the Special Rapporteur has mentioned, many countries in the region have been extending social protection also to workers in the informal economy, but a lot of these measures were short term and they often do not provide adequate protection uh, to those who need it. And the COVID-19 pandemic is really a powerful reminder to all of us that in our interconnected world, a weakness in a country's health and social protection system poses a risk to public health and income security everywhere because we have open borders. If one country doesn't have proper social protection and health system which protects the people, you it's yeah so what can countries what can countries do to um when they really move out of the more crisis response measures into recovery uh, as already mentioned it will be very important to really build on and transform temporary relief measures into comprehensive social protection systems including floors and these should be really in line with human rights and international social security standards, as already mentioned before by the special rapporteur. And we should really ensure inclusiveness, non-discrimination, responsiveness to special needs, gender equality. There are some examples of really small steps how you can really kind of use the more temporary measures to transform or to kind of already think about recovery. I don't really think there are examples of it in the region, but other countries outside the region, for instance, have used social security institutions as channels to identify and register informed economy workers. Because informed economy workers were so far really invisible to the public um, authorities. And by using social security institutions to um, register these workers, it could be a first contact point between those who are really invisible and the public authorities. And this could also promote future formalization of these workers and enterprises. Um, sorry, it's someone, I think someone unmuted themselves, so I'm not sure if there was a... Right. Okay, good. Uh, another important point is to, if we think about developing solutions to extend social protection, it should be done through an inclusive social dialogue. Really, it should be important to uh, actively engage with organizations of workers and employees in the informal economy, because the recovery, only then the recovery can address their needs. And in some countries in the region, such as Indonesia and the Philippines, we already have some nice examples of how workers' organization can facilitate the enrollment of informal economy workers and, for example, collect contributions and just burden their, uh, just relieve their burden. Um, another third uh, and very important point, which has already been mentioned, so I will be brief, is mobilizing additional resources for the extension of coverage. There was a question by Kun Kasi for on social protection expenditures, and in fact, in the ILO estimates that in Scandinavia and like the low, the high income countries in Europe, over 15% of the GDP is allocated to social protection, whereas in Southeast Asia, almost all countries, it's less than 5% of GDP. So where to start if we think about, I mean, what kind of concrete steps can we do when it comes to um, extending social protection? It's really key to push governments to think outside of the box. There's really no one size fits all solution. Every country is very unique in their uh, barriers. So it can be legal barriers. It can be administrative barriers, it can be trust issues, information issues. So you, but for you, I think as parliamentarians, um, most relevant would be really to identify and reduce the legal barriers which exist in the systems. For example, self-employed workers in a lot of countries are excluded from the social protection system um, explicitly by social security legislation. Uh, agricultural workers and temporary workers are excluded in Thailand, for example. Migrant workers are excluded in Brunei and Singapore. And domestic workers are usually also group which are often excluded, for example, in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar and Thailand. 
And what also has been shown by the COVID crisis is really the, the worrying coverage gaps in sickness benefits and unemployment benefits, which I've already mentioned before. And I think there's huge potential now in the crisis to really think about the importance of these benefits to protect people in case they get sick or, or lose their jobs. Um, and while it's really important to develop inclusive legal frameworks, it's obviously also important that this that law translates into practice, because even if you have a law, it can be other barriers in practice, simplifying administrative procedures, tailoring payment mechanisms to the workers uh, characteristics, ensuring compliance, building trust are some of the important issues we need to think about. And um, as many of you, I think, are working in areas other than social protection, one last point I would like to make is the need to move out of a silo approach to a really holistic policy approach. Because the barriers to formalization are very diverse. It's not just one, and it's diverse across countries and also across different sectors across different groups of workers and social protection is just one element to reduce decent work deficits in the informal economy we have to think about for example a better coordination between social protection and tax authorities could help to better identify and register enterprises and workers linkages between social protection and uh, policy areas such as labor legislation business formalization enterprise development they are all really important to facilitate and to promote um, formalization. And this is really key to ensuring that workers in the informal economy are adequately protected in this crisis, but also in all the future crises to come.